Hello, welcome to Nature Source Care. This is Dr. Fonda Goldman. I wanted to share with you uh, natural ways to treat poison ivy if you happen to run into a patch and uh, have a little bit on the skin. So a word of caution first before we get too deep into this is that, you know, if this is a serious case of poison ivy that we're talking about, you should really go see a physician. And when I mean serious, what I'm talking about is if the poison ivy is near your mouth, nose, ears, eyes, or genitals, um, any sensitive spots, any uh, sign that it might be getting close to going internal, not a good uh, idea to treat this on your own. Go see a physician right away. Um, if you've inhaled or ingested poison ivy as far as you know, so eaten some or maybe breathed it in if you were burning some, burning some maybe uh, leaves or branches or something out in the yard and you burn some poison ivy as well. Um, so it's gotten into your digestive system or your respiratory system. You want to go see a physician right away. If the poison ivy is over an extensive area of your body and there's a, especially a lot of open uh, oozing wounds that are part of it, you want to go see a physician right away. If you've tried a few things, it's not getting any better or it's actually getting worse, you want to go see a physician. And if any of the open areas seem like they're becoming infected, um, you see blood, for example, or pus, you should go see a physician. So what I'm going to talk about now is not appropriate for any of these situations, where I'm just talking about if it's a mild to moderate case of poison ivy. When we're talking about poison ivy, we could actually be talking about poison oak or poison sumac as well actually any plant that might cause some sort of contact dermatitis uh, inflammation of the skin when you touch it. Um, and as part of that inflammation, what you'll see is uh, with the skin, typically redness, it'll be very itchy, there'll be some swelling, uh, blisters, uh, vesicles, they're sometimes called. Um, and if the blisters get big enough and um, they pop open, you'll start um, oozing fluid from those blisters. Uh, with poison ivy, the main cause of this is an oil called urushiol. Um, and so when you're treating poison ivy, what you're trying to do is get that oil off the skin and off of you and then treat the underlying uh, irritated skin. You can get poison ivy by touching the plant directly. That's the most common way. Or you can get it by inhaling smoke if you happen to burn it. Uh, maybe you're doing some yard work and cleaning up, that sort of thing. It's thought of most commonly as a summer concern. Uh, you might be out in the yard or near plants or near the woods more often, um, and your skin might be more exposed because you're wearing shorts or short sleeves, but you can actually get poison ivy any time of the year, so be aware of that. And the best way to prevent uh, getting poison ivy is to stay clear away from it, know what it looks like, and then use a protective barrier. So gloves, uh, long sleeve clothes, uh, shirts, um, long pants, socks that, you know, cover your ankles, that sort of thing. So when you get poison ivy, the, one of the most important things to do is actually to clean the skin, keep it um, dry and cool, um, to just get that poison ivy oil off your skin first so it doesn't keep spreading and the wound has a chance to heal. Uh, you want to wash the skin three to four times a day with a gentle natural soap. And by gentle natural soap, I mean soaps that are made from things like oatmeal, neem, aloe vera, rose and sandalwood are very cooling and soothing to the skin. Um, Bronner's baby soap, uh, baby unscented liquid soaps are also very good. And you could even use calendula soap. Um, the way you want to wash is you want to wash in warm water very thoroughly for about five minutes and then finish with a cool rinse for one to two minutes. So you don't want to use extreme super hot or extreme super cold here, just warm water and then cold water. Um, what The reason why this works is it's called a contrast hydrotherapy. The warm water is going to expand the blood vessels. That brings in fresh blood to cleanse the area and nourish the area so that healing can happen faster. It also flushes out inf inflammation. Um, and the cool water uh, constricts the blood vessels so that it decreases swelling. Um, and if the wound happens to be oozing, um, it'll actually kind of stave that off. 
when you wash, you want to move in a direction away from any sensitive areas. So if you have, for example, some poison ivy on your cheek, you want to wash away from the eyes, nose, mouth, that sort of thing, um, because you don't want that poison ivy uh, oil getting internal. When you wash, you want to only use your hands, so use a sponge or loofah washcloth or anything like that, because you might get poison ivy oil on it, and then you might be uh, yeah, spreading the oil all over your body and making things worse. Uh, so this method is um, really effective for removing the toxic oil that's causing the irritation, preventing infection in case the vesicles open up, and also modifying the circulation to decrease swelling and inflammation and help the wound heal faster. So wound care is important. Uh, if the skin is open, opens up, or is oozing, so some of these vesicles get pretty big or you get a lot of them um, and they open up, you want to wash the area first. So again, see the previous slide for details on that. After you've washed the area thoroughly, you want to blot the area dry with a hand towel. So don't use any extreme movements here, just gentle blotting to pick up some of the water that's washed the wound then it would be preferable to let the skin air dry, you know, a good one to five minutes. Um, if it's a small area and it seems to dry up on its own, you can leave it to air dry, um, but that may not be um, possible if it's really kind of oozing all over the place. Um, it might start actually sticking to your clothes or at night it might stick to your bed sheets or furniture fabric, that sort of thing, depending on where it is and you know, where you're sitting and moving and touching. So what you can do to pr protect the wound as well as um, absorb that liquid so it's not sticking to everything is you can create a bandage using sterile nonstick pads and bandage tape. These are things that you can pick up at most um, uh, pharmacies. Shouldn't be too hard to find. You don't want to use uh, regular band-aids or gauze um, because they're not absorbent enough um, and the gauze uh, that'll just stick to the wound even more and then when you try to pull it off it'll you know really um, <laughs> pull the skin away and make things more of a mess actually so using the non-stick sterile pads um, and the bandage tape works pretty well um, so again just keep the wound clean and dry and protected um, you know from bumping from infection especially if you have like kids and pets who might be jumping all over you you want to protect your skin um, but you also want to protect them from getting any oil on on them and again the clothes and sheets and stuff that I mentioned um, it makes it a lot more comfortable to move into sleep it may be that the nonstick pads are not enough to actually absorb all the fluid. You might put those on and it works, but actually the fluid's even kind of, you know, coming through that. If that's the case, uh, what you can do is uh, take a women's, women's panty liner, put that on top of the nonstick pads, um, just wrap that on with a couple uh, pieces of the bandage tape to actually prevent the leaking from coming through. So, for example, if you have maybe you're working and you're working in a fairly formal or conservative environment and you need to wear long sleeves or conservative clothes and yet you have this poison ivy underneath, you want to protect uh, your, your clothes from, um, you know, the fluid that's coming out of the wound and it's also unsightly. So this actually works pretty well um, in case you're in that situation. But ideally, if you can let this air dry, <laughs> if, you, if you're in that situation, that's the best. But Here's a way to work with, um, again, if the wound is pretty wide and uh, oozing. If the skin is not open and oozing, then you can apply um, one of the following from this list. And these are basically botanical solutions that are helpful with cooling the skin and keeping it dry, absorbing uh, the fluid if there's um, uh, some oil still there. It will keep it from moving around a little bit. So you can make an oatmeal paste if you take oatmeal flakes that are almost like the instant oatmeal kind and mix it with a little bit of water. Then you can mix it with your finger and make a little paste from that and apply the paste directly to the skin. Again, we're talking about skin that's not open and just remember that. 
You can also apply aloe vera, especially the interfoliate gel, a food grade one that's very pure. You can just uh, put with your finger just a slight thin coat of aloe vera on top of the wound and let that air dry. Rose water is also very nice. It's very cooling and soothing for the skin. So you can just take a spray bottle and uh, spritz a little bit on the wound. So the idea again with these botanicals is to keep um, the skin soothed, cool, and dry. Uh, while you might, you might apply uh, these things to your skin, but you also at the same time want to avoid, avoid applying any of your regular oils, creams, moisturizers, sprays, perfumes, etc. anywhere on your body to prevent, prevent further irritation and also to prevent further spreading of moving the oil around. Yeah. Also, you want to avoid scratching, you know, avoid any irritation of the wound. It's already irritated enough. It's best to stay out of the sun and the heat because um, that inflammation doesn't need any more heat or, or sun to exacerbate the situation. It's also best to wear 100% cotton or linen um, next to the wound, so soft, light, cool, breathable fabric. You know, you don't want to be putting a heavy, itchy wool <laughs> next to uh, skin that's already itchy and irritated. It's also important cleaning up uh, your environment because there might be that poison ivy oil on things that you've touched, such as your clothes, your shoes, towels, um, sheets from the bed or the furniture. Um, also, your pets. You might have actually, your pets might have run through some poison ivy and they have some oil on them and then they got it on you. So you wanna make sure that all these things are clean so even if you go through and, and take these steps and you take care of the irritation on your skin, if you don't clean up these things, you might actually reintroduce the poison ivy oil to your skin and, and uh, get the uh, irritation again. So when you wash these things, uh, not your pet necessarily, but the clothes and the towels and the sheets, for example, you want to use plenty of detergent, use very hot water to get rid of the poison ivy oil. With your pet, you want to use, you know, some sort of soap and, and fairly warm water. Uh, cold water doesn't work as well to get the oil off. And then you also want to make sure you're not re-wearing or reusing these fabrics unless they've been thoroughly cleaned to, to get that poison, oil, poison ivy oil off. Um, you may want to also keep a small separate towel to dry the affected areas since you're uh, washing the wound uh, several times a day. Just keep a small separate towel that you change often so you don't have to do, you know, a huge mountain of laundry. Um, and then some of these clothes you might, or um, items like shoes and clothes and stuff, you might be using them seasonally, like maybe you're out in the yard cleaning up leaves in the fall and then you get poison ivy um, a few days later and you don't remember that, you know, you were wearing this uh, sweatshirt uh, while you're out in the yard and um, you think the sweatshirt's fine, you put it back in the closet and then you don't wear it until next fall, you might end up getting the poison ivy again because you never wash the oil off before you put the clothes away for the season. So just remember that before you put your clothes and sheets and towels away. Some botanicals you can use internally to help with poison ivy. Uh, neem is a really great herb. I've used uh, multiple times. It works really well both for clearing the heat and the inflammation, but also preventing any possible infection. That's, it's an antibiotic as well. This you would take about 1,000 milligrams two to three times a day. Go to cola is another really great herb. It's really great at clearing heat and inflammation. It also has a special affinity for the skin. Uh, same dosing there. Aloe vera, so we talked about using aloe vera topically. You can also use aloe vera, the interfoliate gel, food grade, um, commercially prepared aloe vera, not the whole leaf. Whole leaf can be um, a little bit irritating uh, to the digestive tract, but the interfoliate gel, you can take two tablespoons uh, directly or in some water, a little bit of juice two or three times a day. Aloe vera is a great cleanser. It's also very soothing. Um, some people know it because they use it uh, for sunburns and they don't realize you can use it internally as well. Burdock is another herb that's really great at clearing heat and it has an affinity for the skin and also the liver, which is important for clearing heat in the body. 
And again, similar dosing there as neem and goji cola. So the idea with these herbs is that they're mostly clearing heat while reducing swelling. Homeopathy works really great for poison ivy. Uh, these are some of the homeopathics I use most frequently for poison ivy. Costicum is really great. Um, the kind of keynote or reason why you would use causticum is just for deep chemical burns. And essentially poison ivy oil causes a deep chemical burn uh, for, for quite a few people. And these are some of the notes um, from a repertory uh, Bernicke, actually, uh, if you're a homeopathic student. So for causticum, some of the description for skin ailments is that old burns that do not get well and ill effects of burns, pain of, pain of burns. So you see the theme here is burning in general. Um, arsenicum is another great homeopathic I've used several times. The keynote for arsenicum is burning and ulceration, which again, poison ivy uh, irritation fall under. And a uh, description there from Bernicke is itching, burning, swelling, edema, eruption, pustular, dry, rough, scaly. So it's actually giving you almost the whole sort of experience of poison ivy from beginning to end. It starts as kind of itching, burning, swelling, and then it becomes dry, rough, and scaly. So uh, you can see why that might fit a poison ivy profile. Urtica, I, I've actually used uh, quite a bit as well. Um, this is also known as thin nettle. So not poison ivy, but a plant that causes poison ivy-like symptoms. And you can see the description here is itching, blotches, urticaria, burning heat with formication. So like itching and tingling, violent itching, burn confined to skin. So uh, you see the um, similarities here to poison ivy um, irritation. Erythema, so redness with burning and stinging burns and scalds. So you see why this fits pretty well. Leonum is also pretty good. Um, I use it especially for blisters. I've used it for blisters of poison ivy. I've also used it for blisters from like mosquito bites. Um, you can see the description here. It affects also the skin producing an eruption like poison oak and it's antidotal there too. So most people don't think of leadum um, when they have poison ivy or poison oak, but you can see clearly that there is some similarity. Uh, so leadum has been effective. I've seen it uh, work pretty well. If you're a student of homeopathy, you might be wondering why rust tox is not on this list. Uh, rust tox, you know, for sort of in your intro homeopathy classes, you know, they'll say rust tox, poison ivy, rust tox, poison ivy, almost like a reflex. Um, I've tried using it multiple times and I actually haven't seen clinical improvement. So I don't use it um, for poison ivy. I use one of these other four here. And the dosing on these, I've had good results using a 30C potency, three pellets, two to three times a day. It really accelerates the healing process. Nutrition, you can use nutrition to help uh, with poison ivy. Most people aren't aware of that. But basically the idea with the nutrition is you wanna eat dry, sweet, cooling foods to counteract the heat and the inflammation um, that are going on in that localized um, area with the skin irritation. So with the diet, you wanna avoid hot, spicy, salty, fried, oily, acidic, fermented, or really sour foods. And the reason why these are on the list, so hot and spicy, um, Spicy foods like peppers and that sort of thing, the reason why they're spicy is because they actually have that um, irritative oil from the pepper. So you already have irritated oil on your skin to cause the, the problem. You don't want to take in internally more hot oil from a plant. Um, fried food, hot oil is, is basically like putting grease on the fire. Um, oily is similar. Acidic and fermented foods and sour foods actually... Um, acidic is acid, you know, again, that's corrosive and heating. Fermented foods, to become a fermented foods, they actually, um, as a side product, they create acid. So um, that's why sometimes fermented foods sort of tingle on your tongue. And sour foods also, sour as a taste is a sign that there's some acid in the food. So you don't want to be putting spicy, salty, oily, um, acidic foods <laughs> inside of you because it'll irritate your skin. 
um, what you would want to eat instead are dry, sweet, cooling foods. So for example, rice crackers, apples, pears, potatoes, turkey. You get the idea. You can use some teas. Um, these are some that are cooling, again, drying, sweet, and cooling teas. So cumin, coriander, fennel, cilantro, mint, hibiscus, rose, and burdock. Um, like rose and burdock, I've mentioned before, just in terms of things you can, um, capsules you can take internally or rose water, you can spray on them directly. And with these teas, uh, to make them properly, you want to use about 8 to 12 ounces of water. If you're using a powder, you take about half a teaspoon of powder per that cup of water and use the infusion method, which means that you've boiled some water, you pour the boiling water over the herb, um, and then you cover it, you let it sit for five to eight minutes, and then you might strain it after that. Um, like for cilantro, mint, hibiscus, and rose, so when you're using, you know, whole leaves and flowers, you can also use the infusion method. You might bump that up, though, to a teaspoon since it's taking up more space and there's more space between the leaves and the flowers. If you're using whole seeds and root, for example, with cumin, coriander, fennel, or burdock, um, you want to use a, a whole teaspoon and you want to use the decoction method to cook up that herb um, to make a tea. So with the decoction method, you put the herb in the water, you cover it, you actively boil it for at least 10 minutes, sometimes up to 20 minutes, and then you turn it off um, and then you can strain it if you want. But you need that extra heat, that active boiling to actually open up the seeds and the root, which is harder to get the medicinal properties out. So there's a difference in how you prepare these herbs to get the most out of them. And in general, you just want to drink a lot of water to flush out the toxins and inflammation. You also want to rehydrate yourself because with the swelling and like the vesicle formation, some of the water you're taking in is actually getting sequestered in the tissue and not being used for just general health and balance with the rest of your body. So that's, uh, that should take you uh, up until stage two. So the kind of active... We just talked about the active stage where things are itchy and swelling and kind of a mess and you kind of, it's kind of a little bit of a project. And then typically after three, five, maybe seven days, you're at stage two um, using this, uh, these methods here. Stage two is basically once everything dries up, so it's not spreading anymore, the vesicles um, are crusted or scabbed over and you actually start seeing a little bit of flaking or dryness on the skin instead of wet vesicles. Um, it may actually look more like a sunburn um, and dry and scaly as the skin turns over um, and you're getting rid of that old skin and the new skin's coming up underneath. At this point you can let nature take its course and just go live your life, um, but if you want to gently support the rest of the process, I mean maybe you have some, uh, you know, you're working in a professional environment and you can't, you know, it's sort of unsightly to have uh, the poison ivy skin even in the dry state out or maybe you're getting some pictures taken for your wedding or something um, you might want to support the process gently so basically you want to take everything down a notch or two you can continue with the contrast hydrotherapy so warm five minutes cool one minute but only do that once a day rather than several times a day aloe vera you can still use topically or internally that's the interfilet gel and do, if you're doing internally, two tablespoons, just once a day though, again, so you're really ratcheting this down. Um, instead of the other homeopathics I mentioned, you might use cantharis or calendula. Both of them are really great for um, sunburns and burns in general, but of a more superficial kind. Cantharis I've used um, really effectively for pretty severe sunburns. I actually got pretty sunburned when I was uh, visiting Bermuda and look bright red, <laughs> even in, in the night. Um, and I took my cantharis, I had a little homeopathy kit with me, and in the morning, the redness was gone, everybody's quite surprised, because usually that sort of lingers for several days, if not a week or more, for some people. But with me, it was over overnight. And calendula um, is also really great for burns. I've actually used it extensively for um, cancer patients who've gone through radiation treatment and they have burns from radiation treatment, like uh, women who've gone through radiation treatment for breast cancer, for example, that works really well. So these are really great homeopathics for 
superficial burns, not as deep as the other ones for stage one, but they work really well at this point just to clear up what's left. And again, just three pellets once a day, not two to three times a day like the other homeopathic. And the other thing is you don't want to still still be gentle with the skin here. You don't want to go uh, overboard uh, or do any peeling or scrubbing, exfoliating. Uh, you want to wait still to apply any oils or creams to the area for at least two to four weeks. The skin superficially may be dry and scaly, but there's still usually some inflammation deep down. If you start applying oils and creams, again, it's like, you know, usually like putting a oil on a fire, it might kind of reignite the irritation um, underneath uh, top layer of dryness. Um, the only thing you might do, you know, again, no extensive peeling, scrubbing, exfoliating, nothing irritating to the skin. You could use a soft washcloth with water and just gently stroke the area a few times gently to remove a few of the scales. Um, but that's about it. That's where I would leave it. Okay, so those are the two uh, stages of poison ivy and how you can deal with them pretty effectively. Um, I've seen this uh, work really well and really accelerate the process of healing. So instead of dealing with uh, poison ivy for three weeks, it might come down to, you know, seven to ten days. So it really cuts the time down and, and to half or even a third potentially. Thank you for taking the time to listen and learn. I hope you stay well. Take care.